You're listening to a special edition of On the Record, online with Eric Schwartzman, the official podcast of the Public Relations Society of America International Conference, October 16th through 19th, 2010, in D.C. Featuring conference keynote speakers, panelists, and newsmakers. To join PRSA or register for the conference, visit prsa.org. Hi, I'm Joanne Colleen. I am the guest host today of On the Record Online. Today, I'm speaking with Karen Gee McCauley, Executive Vice President of Blaze PR. She's been with Blaze for 20 years and has a total of 25 years of experience in the travel and hospitality PR industry. Welcome. Thank you very much, Joanne. Well, tell us a little bit about what's going on in the hospitality industry Last time we checked, 2007 was a fabulous year for everybody in business, and then something happened in 08, and here we are in 10. What do you think happened? Well, the um, recession has affected virtually every industry um, that is out there trying to make a profit, and the travel industry is no exception. Um, we really started feeling it. The, the, the travel industry lags the recession, the start of the, a recession by anywhere from 9 to 12 months. And so while the um, financial sector and other industries felt it in 08 or, or started feeling it in 08, we didn't feel it until like Q4 of 08. And then every, you know, and then the AIG effect happened and I don't know if your listeners know what that is but basically it's it's the boondoggle that AIG the insurance firm had at a luxury hotel in Orange County um, right after they had gotten bailout money and from that came this terrible backlash from corporate America not wanting to be singled out the way AIG did and canceling meetings, canceling conventions at luxury properties or any hotels that were perceived to be um, resort-like or have resort amenities. And so from that, the group business, which is a huge component of a hotel and resort and a destination's um, revenue, um, basically dropped tremendously. And then compounding that was the real estate markets around the country and basically leisure travelers or people who would go on vacation, um, they, they were incredibly um, afraid and cautious and wary and lacked confidence that they would have a job. Well, it sounds to me like it was all the elements for the perfect storm. It so was. AIG got a bailout. Sounds to me like an inappropriate activity might have implied that the taxpayers were paying for this with the bailout money. So is it safe to say that AIG, without really being aware of it, brought the focus to the travel and tourism industry in ways that weren't quite there before? Well, I think they they definitely, um, I think that situation, that crisis, just hit at a time when there were a lot of eyes and ears <laughs> watching and listening. And when that news came out, it really did um, exacerbate everything else that was going on in the economy at that time. And so um, basically the travel industry tanked, you know, um, through 2000, well, the last of 2008 through 2009, um, through this year as well, we're seeing hotels that are um, increasing in occupancy, which everybody wants, right, because there's more people staying there. But what hasn't um, rebounded is room rate. The average daily rate, the ADR for the, the industry, The ADR right? for the industry. And it's because everyone during the height of the recession was discounting so much just to get people in the door that they're now, you know, people are struggling to get that rate back because the demand isn't quite what it was, right, and in 07. And the consumer 07, and, the consumer, and with that lower rate, that's the price point that they're going to pay. 
the so consumers. So how do you recover? You may have more, as we say in the business, heads on pillows, right? Guests in the rooms. But if the room rate isn't what it was in the past, how do you make money in the hotel business right now? Well, there's, um, you know, clients are, are, our clients are doing things by trying to keep um, the guest dollar on property, you know, there's restaurants, there's spas, if it's a resort, there's golf, there's other activities to do at a resort. So one stop experience, so they don't leave the property and spend those limited dollars someplace mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. So how has that changed in terms of marketing and PR? Did you have to restructure and come up with ideas and new programs to keep people on property? or? How quickly did this all come together? We, we realized we, the economy was tanked. Well, most of our, during, you know, right after the recession hit, um, all of our clients really switched to a drive-in strategy, a regional strategy where they, you know, people weren't willing to fly across the country or to fly internationally to go mm-hmm. on vacation, but they were willing to take a staycation. Staycation is? Is staying close to home just for a weekend or a short period of time. And so our hotels, and this, this happened after 9-11 as well, when people were not flying, um, is they focused on marketing to the customers in their backyard and in the most immediate drivable region mm-hmm. to, to their property or their destination. Okay. So um, we did that. We, um, you know, the, the deal became king. Right, every everybody had to have a deal. Everybody had and, a discount, right? Well, it was either a discount or at the luxury level, it was value added. So they were trying to preserve um, rate integrity by not lowering the rate, but giving them more for that rate. So mm-hmm. you got a hundred dollar food and beverage credit, or you got a spa treatment, or you got um, you know you paid so you three put nights, like a bundled package mm-hmm, together, three nights and get another night free. But still, if you were to give those gift cards or time in the spa, that still cost you money. How did you manage to like still be profitable during that challenging well, time? Well, it costs. Of it costs packaging? money, um, but but rooms are still the most profitable okay. um, revenue department for a hotel. Okay. So, um, as long as you could still get the room. You, you You're know, changing hotels. the perception well, of and, what and what happened, the reality is a hotel's margins were definitely um, shrunk during this time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they will probably continue uh, into 2012. I mean, that's what, every, that's what our clients are saying. That's what they're feeling, that it won't really come back until then. So we've got through 2011 still. We still have two more years to this. recover. Mm-hmm. So how has that impacted the PR business? What have you had to do that's different that you haven't done before to try and get that customer, that guest, that client to come back to the property well, and enjoy that I experience? Well, I think we've, we've become, we just, well, we continue, we, and we were like this before the recession, but we've just been, continued to be extremely strategic in the way we work with our clients. We know what their business goals are, whether it's, um, what their occupancy rate is or their average daily rate or how many clicks they want to the website or how many, um, you know, how much data capture they want to send an e-newsletter with with their latest deals. We know what their objectives are and we, we support those with our activities. What's changed is that um, the social media industry and the demise and the contraction of the traditional media world has really um, enabled us to to work in all channels that affect the travel purchase cycle. Mm-hmm. HSMAI did a survey. And that a, is? Uh, Hospitality Sales and Marketing Association okay. did a survey that said, you know, travel consumers need um, about seven touch points online to influence their travel decision. And if, if us as marketers are not creating and disseminating messages within that space, we're missing half of the purchase cycle, you know? So so we, our guests bypassing travel agents, is everything now online, social media, looking for bargains? Are they couponing? How is that different? Um, I think that travel agents are, they still play a very important role, um, mm-hmm. but 
um, OTAs, which is online travel agents, which is the Expedias and the, the Price Orbitz, Lines and the Price Orbits Line. and the Luxury Links. Um, everybody, it's pretty common knowledge that that's where you can get the best deal. The bargains. That's where you can get the best deal. So travel agents, I think, play a role, especially when a traveler, if it's a business traveler, a group, or a family, when they need more than just a room, right? Because these OTAs really just sell the room. They don't sell anything. A package or yeah, bundle and they don't, together. They don't give you advice. They don't, you know, they don't give sort of the, pers- the Nordstrom personal service mm-hmm. that um, a travel agent would. So we've, we've really changed the way we outreach mm-hmm. to our, either the media to reach our, our consumers or mm-hmm. outreach directly to consumers mm-hmm. through social media. Mm-hmm. Now, give me an example of how social media has changed the way that you're doing PR now for this industry. Um, well, there are a lot of times when we will get a deal from a hotel that if we were to use traditional media, we wouldn't have enough time to get it out, right? So um, say it's a package that launches in two weeks. And they're really, even the deal sections of Sunday newspapers work farther out than that. So we instead would take that information and disseminate it online. What, Facebook, Twitter? Facebook, Twitter, as well as online online um, outlets of traditional media sources. You know, every, every major daily newspaper has a website, and they have content that's separate than the Sunday travel page. Mm-hmm. You know, LA Times has the Daily Dish. They have the Daily Deal blog, and that's all travel-related. Mm-hmm. And the content that runs there doesn't run in the paper. So it's really a great place if you have um, perishable product, right? Something that is quick. Mm -hmm. Um, Electronic channels are a great place for those. So is everybody looking now just on the internet? Is that what they're doing? Looking for bargains, looking for coupons? Is that what's going to happen of people, now? A lot of people are, but there's, there's, a, there's a segment of the you know, consuming public that, that um, you know, they, they can afford not to. Mm-hmm. You know, they can afford to go to a private travel service or a travel agent or... Um, you know, a private residence club or some sort of another vacation option Mm -hmm. service where all the service comes with it. They don't have to really lift a finger. Um, But I think for the general public, um, I think, you know, if you look at the earnings of these online travel agents, I mean, they're just growing by leaps and bounds through the recession. And so I haven't seen any one of them that hasn't. Mm -hmm. So are there any concerns or issues or anything that as we're still trying to recover from this economy moving forward? Anything you're going to do differently or are the consumers still going to stay in their own backyard? Are they going to venture outside of a 20-mile area? What, what do you see happening in the next two years? I think people will definitely start venturing out as confidence builds. you know. And there, there's still a segment of the traveling public that has no qualms about traveling far, especially um, boomers. We represent a river cruise line and their primary audience is 55 and above. And they have grown in the double digits since the recession. In this challenge economy? Mm -hmm. And so it's because their customer um, isn't really worried about the recession. They've got their nest egg already and they're gonna spend it the way they want to spend it. So there's definitely pockets. Little niche markets. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. absolutely. So is it changed from when you started in the business to PR and communicating and trying to figure out how to reach the travel people that want to get you know, out there? No, it really isn't. It, you, it, the, the principles are the same, right? Mm-hmm. It's messaging, mm-hmm. trying to, to, to take that message and reach somebody that you are going to affect Mm -hmm. and it's just a different medium in which we're trying to do it you know and and so many clients they'll say well we only have such and such number followers or fans you know we want more it's like well why do you want more because what are they what are your current fans doing for your business and 
that analogy we use in the offline world too, right? People, some clients will say, well, we only had a million impressions for this month. It's like, okay, but that million impressions got you this amount of business. Mm -hmm. If you had more, would it get you more? Mm -hmm. okay. And so I think it's really about quality versus quantity. Okay, great. We're going to take a break right now. And we'll come back and we'll talk to Karen McGee McCauley, and she's going to talk about what's going to happen in the future. This January 2011, Paul Gillen and Eric Schwartzman bring you the first book devoted exclusively to B2B social media communications. Packed with business to business case studies and applied knowledge, Social Marketing to the Business Customer is the most comprehensive collection of B2B social media marketing guidance ever assembled. B2B markets are driven by value and relationships. That's very different from B2C markets. This book's a hands-on guide. It walks business people step-by-step -step through the process of using social media to find and engage business customers and ultimately drive more revenue. Social Marketing to the Business Customer is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, and Borders. Or buy it at our show blog at ontherecordpodcast.com. Also available for iPad and Kindle. Okay, we're back from our break. And Karen G. McCauley, Executive Vice President, Blaze PR. So what do you see for the future? Um, I see that public relations is going to continue to have to um, deliver to the bottom line in a quantitative fashion for um, the organizations that either agencies are in-house or working for on a continuous basis um, to demonstrate its value. Um, and I think it's going to continue to evolve online because I, there was a survey that was done last week that said, you know, the, that online online communication or online media relations will overtake traditional media relations in about two years. And, you know, when you look at still the amount of contraction that's going on in the offline world, you know, I mean, I don't know if it'll ever really get that far, but I think it'll continue to... Um, to be that way, and because consumers are now, they're in ponds, right? They they, they swim in these little ponds, and it's 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 finding those ponds mm -hmm. of people and word of mouth, which used to be really talking face to face with people you knew or calling people, is now so much bigger than that. It's people sharing word of mouth that you may not even know, but you trust their opinion. Well, how do you how do you measure that? Because in the old days. You know, I used to measure the clips and the column inches, and in PR, you'd translate that over to what that paid advertisement would cost. But now that you have fragmented audiences and different channels, how do you measure success to the client, and how do you convince them that social media is the way to the go? Is is there a way to measure the social media impact? We've been using um, Omniture and Google Analytics to we measure our clients social media campaigns weekly as well as monthly and um, what we gauge is the number of click-throughs that certain sources online sources drive to the website we look at all number of visits um, referral visits direct visits we we really analyze the data and for example one client we got a Wall Street Journal story in but we also got a bunch of other placements, and it really surprised us that the Wall Street Journal actually delivered the fewest number of click-throughs. Really? Mm -hmm, to their what site. What do you attribute that to? We don't know. But it, it's really good for planning, you know, because if you see which outlets deliver the most traffic to the site, then those are the ones that you want to concentrate on. So well, and clearly, a major publication like the Wall Street Journal, you'd think that that would get you a greater return on your investment. But now the audiences are shifting, social media, different ways to get to people. Traditional may not be the mm -hmm. way to go. And there's actually links, stories that have run months ago that were still getting a tremendous amount of click-through because these stories stay live forever, right? Or a That's lot correct. of them. 
Once it's on the internet, so it's not going can, anywhere. You can, people are searching and finding it. They're finding these stories even though they didn't run, you know, very recently. And they're clicking on and they're clicking through and it's like, wow. So it's been, it's been, so that's how we, that's how we, we gauge our, our success a lot of the times. But then it also helps with our planning because we see what's working and what's not. And we can see it on a month to ma- month to month basis. And with those analytics, you can check any time, mm-hmm. you can adjust your messages, mm-hmm. you can adjust your campaign yeah. to see what the response is. Exactly. Very different than traditional. Exactly. Okay. What else do you see? Anything else based on your years in the business? If someone wanted to get into this business, how would they start? Go work at a hotel, work at the front desk? How would you get into travel and tourism PR? Um, well, it, it does help to actually work in a hotel or work in the hospitality industry from an um, in, in-house perspective because you then understand the way a hotel works or you know, working in some sort of a tourism business doesn't have to be a hotel. Um, a you know a journalism degree is um, important or a public relations degree because at the end of the day we are communicating and we are communicators whether it's verbally or in writing um, and I would say you know if if there are kids that are still in school is to try internships that with with either hospitality companies or agencies that specialize in hospitality and um, and learn and learn from it that way because it is a niche it is a specialty and there's a certain way that we communicate in the hospitality industry there's a certain way we write that may not you know be the same for other a little industries. more feature style creating an experience talking about the vision mm-hmm. what the ultimate experience will be if you go to this property or you mm-hmm. enjoy this exactly. a little different than hard news yeah. or earnings yeah. right it's it's pretty it's, it's very experiential mm-hmm. you know because what we're trying to do or what our clients are trying to do is to create memories and memories mm-hmm. and so you try to you know put your reader there mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you, Karen G. McCauley. And this is Joanne Colleen saying thank you for On the Record. Thank you. You've been listening to a special edition of On the Record Online with Eric Schwartzman, the official podcast of the Public Relations Society of America International Conference, October 16th through 19th, 2010 in D.C. To subscribe to the podcast or share feedback, Post a comment to the show blog at ontherecordpodcast.com. Connect with us on Facebook or Twitter at On The Record. Or send an email to eric at ericschwartzman.com. This podcast has been a special production of On The Record Online and the Public Relations Society of America. Unlike normal productions of On The Record Online, this episode recording cannot be duplicated without explicit permission from PRSA.